it's like, it was, it's really fucked up, but rape isn't always holding someone down and doing something. It's like a mental thing. Who are you? I'm you, but stronger. Hey fuckers, it's Piper Sweeney. Yes, that Piper Sweeney. Back again with my least favorite thing to talk about. Timothy Heller's false sexual assault accusation against Melanie Martinez. My previous video on the topic, why I no longer believe Timothy Heller, got over 1 million views, but haunts me to this day because it was so painfully mediocre, there was no pop filter, and I never expected anyone to see it. If you haven't seen it yet, don't bother watching it, I'll summarize it for you. Oh, uh, hello, my name is Piper Sweeney, I'm a little drunk as usual, and I felt like drawing Melanie Martinez fan art even though I'm not a fan. God, I hope crybabies aren't crazy territorial like old school porcelain in the traps fans. Don't hate me even though I hate Carousel. Uh-oh, what if me drawing this makes my 69 whole subscribers think I support rape? Better write a script explaining otherwise with everything I remember reading off the top of my head. Well, this suffices. Uh, you know what? Fuck this script. And who needs sources? No one will see this video anyway. Oh, shit! Oh, fuck! Oh, no! No, now I have to set myself on fire! And now I am revisiting this topic again anyway. It'll probably be instantly ad-restricted, but I knew that. I didn't make this video for the money. Uh, for those watching the premiere, sit tight and enjoy as I tell you why I made this video to kill some time for some of the stragglers to get here. If not, feel free to skip ahead and change the video speed because this is going to be a long video. <coughs> Excuse me, hiccup. Don't worry, there will be bathroom breaks. Section 0. Why I'm making this now, over a year later. The short answer is to help clear Melanie's name and explain my point of view to others. But there's a little more to it than that. You see, I had been slowly, slowly working on this since Mel's Corner was unjustly deleted because his channel had a lot of information on the alleged assault, albeit scattered throughout multiple videos. But I was ready to give our dear old Timmy a break because I find this topic draining and figured draining, dragging it out would only hurt Melanie more. I mean, not financially. She's gotten a ton of new fans since being falsely accused, me being one of them. All publicity is good publicity, but emotionally. But as some of you have already pointed out to me, I recently got a shout out, hello new subscribers, from one of Timothy's friends. I mean, loose connections, sure. So, one of Timothy Heller's friends, a popular YouTuber who I won't accurately name, no one say his name, it'll only make him more popular, decided it would be a great idea to drag this shit up again right before Melanie's new release. Upcoming musical coming on September 6th. His mistake was dragging me into it. I was not a fan of Melanie at the time, and the title of his video implying otherwise is a blatant lie. I was more invested in my opinion, than the case, and that shows in the video's quality. The Tim vid, as I call it for short, was not good. It lacked embedded evidence, most of my points were underexplained at best, but now I'm revisiting this topic with the full-blown fury of an autistic fanboy, and you should never underestimate an autistic fanboy. So buckle up, Tedwin, your name is Tedwin now, because I'm not nice and I'm not interested in pretending to be. Before you guys ask, because I know if I don't address this now, I'll have to later. No, I did not watch either of Tedwin's videos, although I appreciate the new subscribers he sent my way. I heard he said some inappropriate things about me. I'm not interested in engaging. I've seen some of his videos on Mars Argo, so I already know enough about how he thinks to know whatever he says is going to be littered with confirmation bias and logical fallacies, probably non sequitur, false cause, cherry picking, and begging the question. Those are his favorites. I also hear he strawmanned me, which isn't a surprise. It's easier to misrepresent the truth than change it. Uh, he may have more subscribers than me, but that doesn't make him right, and it doesn't make him better than me or anyone else. Now, Tedwin plans on posting an interview between himself and Timothy Heller, including a pre-planned follow-up video, no doubt because he knows the first will be met with a lot of backlash. Um, it may already be out by the time this video goes up because it's taking me a long time to make this video since I want it to be good. I've been told he's cleaning up his comment section to make it look like everyone agrees with him, and he also claims they are not friends just because they appeared in a video together. 
Speaking of friends, my friend sent me this, and I've been laughing at it ever since, but it's unlikely that he's telling the truth about not being Timothy's friend, or at least I'm sure he thinks they're friends. Firstly, Timothy Heller has the tendency to collect people with connections and convince them they're her friend, so this is typical Timothy behavior, just as she used Sandra's song, who she is also secretly friends with to get a biased nylon article trashing Melanie, invited to their nylon party and the chance to walk down a red carpet and get on Getty Images, oh wow, what an accomplishment. Just as she uses Abigail Breslin to defend her on Twitter rants and she then deletes like a coward, Timothy is using Ted Wynn's large YouTube channel to get people on her side. Friends strike too. You can see Tedwin here crying about how people are calling him biased and how unfair it is. People aren't calling me honest and ready to glare biased as well, as if in a just world everyone would receive the exact same criticisms. This is unsurprising to me because liars have the tendency to try to actively convince you they are telling the truth, whereas people who are telling the truth just expect you to kind of believe them. Saying it doesn't matter that he's biased because everyone is biased is the logical fallacy to coque, which I hopefully pronounced correctly. To coque is Latin for you too. Basically, he's calling you good people hypocrites because he can't argue his way out of a minor criticism, probably can't handle criticism well, and knows he doesn't have enough evidence to prove his point. Friends strike three. The fact that this interview is taking place at Timothy's home strikes me as odd if they really aren't friends. Ladies, would you invite a man you didn't know well to your home? And not just ladies, but people with borderline personality disorder in general. Yes, BPD, a group of people known for being extremely trusting and having no problem trusting people. I learned through life experience, and it was confirmed by two of my professors and the only textbook I opened, and people with BPD tend to have trust issues, especially if they've gone through a traumatic experience like rape, which is what Timothy claims happened. I can't see someone in Timothy's alleged position inviting a strange man into her home for any reason after a friend betrayed her trust and raped her. That just isn't a likely scenario. You could say, But Piper, people with BPD are impulsive. But this trip was planned in advance by weeks at least, and sorry to break it to you, but borderlines aren't creatures of pure instinct and whimsy that jump from one crazy thing to the next. Stop watching TV. That idea contributes to the stigmatization of the mental illness, which, despite popular accusation from Timothy Heller fans, I do not hate people with BPD. For fuck's sake, I spent like six years thinking I had it before eventually receiving an autism diagnosis. My current psychiatrist even says she's not so sure I don't also have BPD or didn't have it once because sometimes borderlines get more stable as they get older and symptoms become less pronounced. I guess that's true because one of my past therapists said something similar. My is the me having autism part because we didn't know about that yet. I mean, come on. Don't you guys find it a little weird that I'm so educated on BPD and all I have is a decade of independent research in the psychology minor? Technically a specialization, but my degree is weird. No one knows what a minor is. I mean, a specialization. Did, did you honestly really think, though, that my entire argument hinges on Timothy has BPD and is therefore evil? So sorry to shoot down your views that I'm just a mean hater who hates Tim because she has BPD. Now, it was nice to clear the air on that accusation since it bothers me that people think I'm ableist against a group I have always vocally defended, but I digress. Typical ADHD. Man, there's a lot of share wrong with me. Hey, what was it Timothy was saying about BPD again that somehow doesn't have y'all pissed? I never struggled with telling the truth. That just wasn't a symptom that I, I exhibited ever. I didn't really, I am not a liar. Being a liar is not a diagnostic criteria for BPD, nor was it one when she said this. I have no idea why she said this. Do you think maybe I could have this? And she was like, um, no, you definitely don't have it because you're not malicious and you don't seek revenge on people. And I was like, okay, I didn't know you had to have all of the symptoms, which you don't, but like, I trusted her. Back to the yes, they're fucking friends point. Friends strike four. This friendly exchange occurred on Twitter. Makes sense that they'd have friendly exchanges like this since they're friends. I didn't even go looking for this. My friends just sent me this stuff. My god, you really hate him for coming at me, don't you? <laughs> and Friends Strike 5, the original video proving they were previously acquainted and have been for multiple years that he insists just 
doesn't matter. Name is car, uh, and I just had a wildest pee because. Are we in the vlog, dude? Oh yeah, welcome, so, welcome yes. to the vlog, Timothy. Thanks, um, Taylor. I just want to tell you about um, your idols here because <laughs> Evan just peed in public, <laughs> and if the police are watching this, please arrest him. I'm pretty open about peeing You're in public. Took a piss. Okay, guys, you guys know I hate wasting. I'm not gonna waste a flush of water. You guys know how much water that is. You're People... right. You do use three to school police toilet toilet paper squares to wipe your ass. <laughs> oh my god, don't tell. Him. Okay, yeah, I. Exposed. Well, because I barely use toilet paper. To... It doesn't take a genius to see that they're friends. Doesn't even take a body language analysis. Any idiot can tell their friends. Yes, everyone is biased. I'm biased, you're biased, we're all biased. But some people are able to overcome their bias if they use logic. My bias initially led me to believe Timothy's claims until I looked into them because I was sexually assaulted and I don't like thinking someone would lie about something like this. So for a long time, I refused to give Melanie so much as the benefit of a doubt. Then I got curious how she still had fans like half a year later after hearing a remix of one of her songs on a Nightcore stream. I realized I was thinking with my feelings and not my head, read Melanie's statement, then Timothy's statement, and fell into a huge click hole of evidence because I was a recent college grad with fewer than 100 subscribers who had no life. I examined both sides, and I chose Melanie. Tedwin claims in a tweet that I lost track of that he looked into all the evidence and came out with the conclusion that Melanie is a rapist and I call bullshit. He's either stupid or lying and I personally suspect it's the latter. Someone sent me a clip of his so-called opinion on Melanie's art, but he can't even give his honest opinion. He lies through the entire thing. It's your channel, but what do you think of Mel's teasers? Okay, so Melanie Martinez's new album is called K-12. through so kindergarten through 12th grade, right? And it looks like uh, she's walking with her friends in doll outfits, I, I guess I could say, because I don't, I don't remember seeing anybody dressed like that in my school days. And one of her friends has her period. Okay. You know, I think that's cool. I think that a woman in her mid-20s wanting to dress up uh, as a doll and pretending to be in middle school and saying, oh, at her friend bleeding through her dress is a great thing. I think next we need Justin Bieber, another man in his 20s, to make maybe make a teaser for his next album where he has like an awkward, you know, erection. That would be cool. We need some male representation. He should also dress up like like, like a doll. I'm sorry, Justin Bieber is the only artist that came to mind because he's also like the same age as Melanie Martinez. But but is there like another artist in their 20s that dresses up as a much younger self or like a like a doll and does this kind of thing? Because I, I want to make like an equal comparison, you know, because. I don't know. It's very, it's, it's definitely an interesting art, you know. She went from doing her first album, dressing up and pretending to be like a like a crybaby, and now it seems like she's doing a new concept album where she um, dresses up as um, kindergarten through middle schooler. Interesting. Let's have a moment of silence for his girlfriend. It appears that he's never seen her, and that's so sad. We have to arrange a meeting between them. After all, he's never heard of anyone dressing like this. Do you think he knows she has an Instagram? This is just so tragic. Okay, that's enough sarcasm. You see him do the believe me look throughout the video. And also how long she holds her eyebrows in that uncomfortable upward position, which I would call the believe me look. If you haven't watched my last video, basically the believe me look is whenever your brain is trying so hard to create an image inside of it that your face physically cannot relax. Oftentimes, this can be associated with deception. Odd gesture to see on someone who's just giving their opinion, wouldn't you think? Now, this wouldn't be proof that he's lying on its own, even with his overuse of gestures, which is another sign someone is lying, because you need multiple signs to guarantee someone is lying. Except, he catches himself and tries to correct it, but he's unable to keep a relaxed face while speaking, so he simply scrunches his face in the other direction to hold it in. Now, you may say, Piper, how do you know he's not just weirdly expressive and tense about something else, or whatever your excuse for this is? The odds of him not knowing about the Believe Me look are low, as one, he has a body language analysis video on his channel, so one would hope he actually put time and effort into learning how to read face and body language before making such a video, and two, he's likely ran across Reagan Wolf's body language analysis of Timothy, where she points out the same look on Timothy's face. Originally, I had a very long-winded explanation about how unlikely 
It was he didn't find that video based on me giving Reagan Wolf a shout out and the YouTube algorithm pairing our videos together. However, this has been made a lot simpler. I just recently noticed that Reagan deleted the original description and wrote in all caps that she loves Tedwin, spelled L-U-V, and disabled the comments. I am unable to tell if this is sarcasm, but I'm going to guess he attacked her at some point, and rather than make a follow-up video, she has decided to disown her own reading. Makes sense he'd go after her since it was actually a pretty good video. Uh, Timmy herself whined about its very existence in a live stream. Look at that stupid video where they analyzed my body language, like, because I smile when things are uncomfortable sometimes, like, people just, mm, I don't even know. <laughs> and after all, he wasted time on my piece of shit. I'm personally disappointed Reagan submitted to him because I found her take on the situation insightful and I agreed with most of it. But, you know, this is none of my damn business so I won't discuss it further. I'll just say, Reagan, you have my support if you want it and I'm here if you need to talk. But on the bright side, at least this proves me right with no effort on my part. He has heard of the believe me look and he knows what it means and what others would think about him if they saw him make that look. Therefore, I conclude he knows about the Believe Me look, and that's why he corrected it upon feeling it on his face so he could look more honest. This is not a subconscious expression. It is the behavior of someone who is deliberately lying and trying to hide it. But what does all of that mean? So, now that I've established this probably isn't his real opinion, we're left to question why he lied about something that should be so innocuous. Well, perhaps he doesn't actually have anything negative to say about Melanie's art. But why would that be a problem? Unless he's friends with Timothy. And since she's a Leo and a Life Path 1, sorry for using astrology, it won't happen again this video, I can imagine Timothy having high expectations for loyalty, and as someone with BPD, she probably misinterprets certain gestures as negative. I don't really like walking on eggshells as a descriptor for being friends with someone who has BPD because it makes them sound like maniacs, but I remember my ex-friend Ashley always saw lots of little things and even purely fictional imagined things as me rejecting her totally because of her black and white thinking. Spoiler alert for those who haven't watched my video yet, our friendship ended because she had the false belief that I was going to marry my loser boyfriend, as if, and move away, and she sabotaged our relationship to prevent this imagined possibility, even after I explicitly told her that I was going to choose her. After that, though, I just couldn't trust her, and the friendship ended, leaving me with no one. Point is, friendships with borderlines can be turbulent because of the way their mental illness warps their realities. To enable a black and white thinker, Tedwin may have decided to present a black and white view on Melanie, resulting on his opinion that Melanie isn't a bad friend who makes good art, but a purely bad person with nothing good about her. At the same time, he can't come right out and say, wow, Melanie sucks, because then he has to admit that he's biased. Boo-hoo. Or the reason he lied could be as simple as, I attracted all these people who blindly hate Melanie to my channel and now I have to feed the beast that I've created through my own deception. Those are both just theories though, so let's not waste more time on them. To me, the reason he lied about something so simple isn't that important. It's the sheer fact that he can't even tell the truth about something so small as his opinion on the clothes Melanie wears. So I ask you to be just as wary of this interview as you were on the one where Timmy preyed on a teenage girl, if not more so because of Tedwin's false charm and the probability that he'll coach Timothy on how to lie better. And of course, to be skeptical of his channel in general, now that he's proven he can't be trusted. And to be aware that Timothy is dragging this shit up again like two years later or some shit like that, because she's about to release her EP and she needs attention, so she's clearly playing the same move twice. After all, it's well known that she posted her initial strike on Melanie after her single for the song Sleep flopped. And Tedwin, of course, is being an enabler by helping her lie to get attention now that Melanie is relevant and in the news again. But please, no cyberbullying. I'm not just calling him Tedwin because it's more fun to say in his, than his real name, though that is part of it. I'm trying to dissuade people from looking him up just to harass him. Your time would be much better spent sending messages of love to Melanie, aka the real victim in this situation, and ignoring people like Tedwin and Timothy. And a brief message to Tedwin if you are here. 
I may not be merciful or particularly tactful or even a half-decent person, and it's not like I even have any dignity to lose, but I'm more than willing to drop this anyway. Why? Because it's exhausting and I want no part in it. I never did. I only returned to this topic to defend myself and my opinion, and I only came for you because you came for me. In my eyes, we're even now. Consider this video a warning strike. You leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. I won't make a video response on either of your Timothy Heller interviews. I won't drag you. It'll be like I've never even heard of you, and you've never even heard of me. Not everyone gets a free pass from me like this, and I stress that you are only getting it because I am busy working on other things. Take it with what's left of your reputation, which you are slowly destroying by siding with this toxic woman who is only interested in your subscriber count. Oh, and speaking of subscribers, thanks for the ones you brought my way. They mean a lot to me, each and every one of them. As for Timothy Heller, if you're watching, it is and never was anything personal or malicious. I wish you no ill will, and I ask that people not send her hate either. I know she encourages her fans who harass Melanie Martinez fans. You don't have to send me the screenshots and protests. I have seen them. I'll even talk about it later, but understand that returning this immature behavior will make you feel worse in the end. Disagreeing is both okay and encouraged, but for everyone's sake, please keep your debates civil. At this point, I am only interested in clearing Melanie's name and producing a video that's worthy of the 1.2 million views the last one got. When I came into the Melanie Martinez fandom, it was not a happy place, but I think we can be strong and make it one again. Well, I hope everyone's here because I'm going to get started now. Let's get this over with so I can get back to practicing my jump kicks so I can make Seagun proud. Section 1. The Summary Melanie Martinez is a singer born in New York. She rose to fame after appearing as a contestant on The Voice when she was only 17 years old and released her debut album Cry Baby in 2015. Timothy Heller is another singer who was born in Portland where she and a friend formed a band called The Dresses. At some point, both of them moved to Los Angeles, California, likely to pursue careers as singers and I guess in Timothy's case to get famous or whatever. I mean, why else would you trade Portland for Hollywood? Melanie already had a following from The Voice, but Timothy was not so well known. Still, at some point, the two met and became friends. Melanie even let Timothy's band, The Dresses, open for her during the Dollhouse tour. Later, the two women stopped being friends. The date this happened is unclear because of multiple contradictions, but I'm guessing it happened within the first couple of months of 2017 because of things Timothy has tweeted that I cannot find to post. I think they've been deleted. Timothy stated it ended because Melanie told her that she had to cut people out of her life in order to win a Grammy, and I stand by my previous statements that this really does sound like something Melanie would say. And on October 18, 2017, Timothy dropped her single, Sleep. Unlike Melanie, Timothy was not famous and she got no attention for her single. As a matter of fact, she only got 777 streams on Spotify the day she announced it on Twitter. About a month later, on November 17th, Timothy began laying the groundwork for her accusations against Melanie Martinez by tweeting the following. What if I have my own story of abuse, but I'm scared to ruin the person's life and I still love them in a fucked up way and the public really, really loves them and most probably wouldn't believe me, dot 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 dot, I need advice. According to Newsweek, Melanie tried to contact Timothy 20 minutes after she tweeted that and Timmy blocked her number. Melanie then contacted Timmy's boyfriend, got no answer, and sent him texts asking him to put her in contact with Timmy, saying she had a dream about her and suggesting services of a healer named Raven. However, there are conflicting reports from Timothy herself, who also claims that Melanie never tried to contact her. Yeah. Um, okay, so someone just asked this, and I have it written down. Did, has Mel reached out to you? I know the answer, but for everyone... That no, she hasn't. She hasn't even tried? Has she tried to talk to your boyfriend? Or not? Uh, I mean, we both have her blocked, but I feel like there could have been other ways for her to reach me. I mean, her my email's on my Instagram. Mm-hmm. It's true. But the healer thing has remained consistent, so at least that part's probably true. Not quite two months after the flop of sleep, on December 4th, 2017, Timothy Heller accused Melanie Martinez of raping her after they smoked marijuana together during a sleepover in 2015. 
Timothy Heller tweeted the following, When I wrote this story about my assault, I initially wasn't going to make the abuser, but I think it's important for you all to know this is about Melanie Martinez. I think by make she meant mark or maybe name. I'm going to go with name. This seems like an autocorrect thing. Attached to the tweet was a four-long page rape accusation, making it the longest accusation in the entire history of Twitter. And now I read the whole thing because my throat just doesn't hurt enough here already at the bottom of page eight of my script. I have kept this secret for years, convincing myself that it wasn't a big deal and I wasn't hurt by it. The thought of accepting that my best friend raped me seems insane. Even typing that doesn't feel real to me. I started telling the story to those closest to me as somewhat of a joke. Ha ha, can you believe this crazy night? But I began to get responses I wasn't expecting. Concerned ones. It's hard to say someone you loved raped you. Someone you still love. The thought of writing this and having the world see it terrifies me, especially because of who this person is. This was my best friend. She took me in, which I was so grateful for. I felt like I owed her my life, and my life began to revolve around hers. I had my own problems, but if I could focus on her life, I could put off dealing with my own inner turmoil for just a bit longer. Some of her fans became my fans, but their loyalty never strayed from her. They're dedicated. She's perfect. To the public, she can do no wrong. She's there for her fans. She gets it. She's different. When faced with a friend who really needed help, though, I can honestly say she let me down completely. During the most difficult time in my life, my rock bottom, her power and control over me grew and grew, and I was silenced. While being open about realizing how much help I needed, I was made to feel guilty. I had to apologize for having an extreme panic attack where I thought I was going to die because it ruined her night. Endless incidents like this. I had become a problem. Yet through it all, I loved her. Codependency works in a lot of strange ways. In my relationship with this friend, I was dependent on helping her with her life. As soon as I needed a small bit of focus and support from my best friend, there was nothing for us to relate to each other about. Our friendship was about her. The power she had over me grew into me having a very hard time saying no to her. I would do almost anything for her. One night, during a sleepover, she became increasingly interested in my sexual preferences. As someone who had previously been through sexual abuse, sex is hard for me to talk about. I was obviously uncomfortable, but she was my best friend, so I tried to be open about it. The conversation never seemed to end, though. I had to work very early in the morning. She began asking me while in bed if I would have sex with her. While being incredibly uncomfortable by this offer, I attempted to laugh it off. I had a boyfriend at this time, and she knew that. Quote, he doesn't have to know, it's not a big deal, end quote. It went on for hours, asking me why I didn't want to, and that it would be fun. I repeatedly said no, I had to work in the morning, I just wanted to sleep, I was exhausted. I attempted to sleep but was kept up the entire night by my friend begging me to sleep with her. It seemed strange, but she was my best friend. I said no, and I thought we could move on. The next night, unfortunately, went the same way. Regardless of my response the first night, she was not giving up. If she had gotten the hint, she didn't care. I was exhausted. She convinced me to smoke weed, and since I have a hard time saying no to her, I complied, thinking maybe then I'd be able to just fall asleep and avoid the situation altogether. The same conversation began to happen, continuously trying to convince me it was going to be okay and it would be fun and feel good. I would say, my boyfriend would be so upset. I really need to sleep. I have to work in the morning. I said every form of no I could think of. As I lay praying to fall asleep, she began touching my arm. I allowed this to happen. Maybe she'd give up. This went on for maybe an hour. I got increasingly uncomfortable. I started giggling, saying that it tickled. I in no way wanted to make this a sexual situation. Quote, Can I just do this? Can I just touch your arm? Can I just touch your boobs? End quote. She began bartering with me. 
All I wanted to do was go to sleep. She began talking about the appearance of my boobs and begged to just touch them. We didn't have to do anything else. I was so exhausted and confused and high and belittled, I just allowed it to happen. This led to her touching the rest of me. I never said yes. I said no, repeatedly. But she used her power over me and broke me down. Just so there is no confusion, I was molested by my best friend. I lay still in shock, completely not reciprocating. I hate speaking so bluntly on this because it makes me feel extremely uncomfortable, but she performed oral sex on me and then I was penetrated with a sex toy without being asked. That's what happened. The bottom line that I need to always remind myself is that I said no for two nights straight. It doesn't matter that I didn't resist during the action. I had been broken down. She knew I didn't want to. I made that clear. I didn't scream at her. I didn't force her off of me. One, because I loved her. Two, because I just wanted it all to be over. We never talked about this night ever again. While it completely messed with my head, there was no way I could have been raped by my best friend. Right? Our friendship ended because she decided she didn't have time for me anymore. To worry about me anymore. She cared too much about me. It was holding her back. I'm not sure how to end this story. I'm terrified of the response I'm going to get. The only reason I do this now is because I'm hoping because of recent events, people will believe me. If you begin to doubt the abuse taking place in this story, I beg you to imagine her role in this being a man. Girls can rape girls. Best friends can rape best friends. Friendship does not equal consent. Silence does not equal consent. I wish it wasn't so hard for me to convince myself of these things. Melanie Martinez responded with the following tweet, which I accessed via archive because a bot automatically deletes all her tweets after one year. On December 4th, late at night, she wrote the following empathetic but poorly worded statement. I am horrified and saddened by the statements and story told tonight by Timothy Heller. What she and I shared was a close friendship for a period of time. We came into each other's lives as we were both starting our careers as artists and we both tried to help each other. We both had pain in dealing with our individual demons and the new paths we were forging. But I truly felt we were trying to lift each other up. She never said no to what we chose to do together. And although we parted ways, I am sending her love and light always. I say poorly worded because the next day on December 5th, Newsweek posted an interview with Timothy who manipulated the situation by cropping the second to last sentence to make it say, she never said no, instead of, she never said no to what we chose to do together, key verb being chose. But we'll get to that lie later since I already debunked it in like two seconds. Melanie lost about 200,000 followers, but a lot of people were suspicious of Timothy's story. Although Timothy gained a lot of new followers who felt sorry for her, crybabies were not convinced and went through their social media timelines to uncover evidence that Melanie is innocent. Early proof wasn't perfect, but managed to produce an unquestionable alibi for Melanie, pointed out contradictions in Timothy's statement that she has yet to address, and brought attention to Timothy's strange behaviors. On December 9th, Melanie posted a follow-up message clarifying the situation since her last statement was misinterpreted and thanks fans for clearing her name. She said, I understand how hard it can be to see my side of the story, considering no one with a heart would want to invalidate anyone speaking up about this topic. I want to thank my fans who took the time to research the timeline, analyze past Instagram posts, and question the story being told, which reveal her false statements. I trusted so many people in my life who took advantage of that trust for their own personal gain. Please know that my intentions with everything that I do in my life are always pure and I would never be intimate with someone without their absolute consent. Ah, bless that clear wording. And she regained about... 100,000 of her lost followers, and I need to drink some water before I die. That same day, Timothy Heller did an interview with a girl whose identity I will withhold because she was 15 years old at the time and is still a minor. She has stated that she is uncomfortable with the fact this interview is out there, was nervous during the interview, and does not believe Timothy. 
I'm not sure what time this was posted, but it originally aired on you now. On December 22nd, 2017, Melanie posted a song called Piggyback. I consider this Melanie's third statement. In it, she shares her side of the story in the form of song lyrics. I normally eye roll at people who try to use lyrics to accuse someone of something, but in this case, the lyrics are very clearly about Timothy Heller. Of Timothy's claim that Melanie was her best friend before the alleged assault, Melanie sings this. I have one best friend to this very fucking day since we were five years old and I fucking moved away. I wish I never did because she's the only one who sees me for who I really am instead of how many I reach. Oh. Friend she's talking about is Jacqueline Molina aka Jackie back from her days in New York City. According to the Crybaby credits, they became friends in kindergarten and are still friends to this day. Timothy is not even mentioned in these credits, making me wonder if they were really as close as Timothy claims. In piggyback, Melanie goes on to explain that Timothy and her team were only interested in befriending Melanie in hopes that they could leech off her already established fame, something that's very common in Hollywood. Trusted too many fake people while I was still young, gave them the benefit of a doubt I was so wrong. I cut them off and they came for blood because they know they ain't getting no more. I'm so done with playing piggyback, oh. Swear to God I wished you all the best, oh. And then in the chorus, Melanie very bluntly states that Timothy and company's motive for lying is to get fame and expresses her feelings of hurt and betrayal. You're lying your way to gain a piece of me when you know you could never come close because I know my destiny. I worked hard for my shit, put my love in this shit, now you're trying to kill my name for some fame, what is this? Tried to help you do your shit, encouraged you to work on it, was a good friend and you used that to your advantage. The rest of the song isn't really that relevant. It's about how she's moving back to New York City, then the chorus again. I just wanted to share this perspective since a lot of people have this misconception that Melanie never contested any of the claims against her, nor explained why she was targeted or anything like that. As I said in section zero, only liars have to try to convince you they're telling the truth. Melanie's statements may not have been cleverly worded, but the fact that Melanie was able to say her piece so effortlessly with so few words is a really strong indicator that she's telling the truth. Also, remember Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is most likely to be true. As we go on, you'll learn why believing Timothy requires a complicated matrix of explanation for her strange behaviors, whereas believing Melanie doesn't even cause the slightest plot hole. This case may be pretty cut and dry if Timothy would stop encouraging her fans to attack Melanie fans, but again, I'll get to that later, because in this channel, we stand evidence, logic, and inductive reasoning that comes from experience and works with the proof, and of course, cold hard facts. The working theory is that Timothy was upset she no longer had Melanie to use for her connections, so she pulled this publicity stunt as a final gambit in an attempt to get attention for her new single. This theory is confirmed by the lyrics of Piggyback and supported by Timothy's attention-seeking behaviors. Timothy lying about this alleged rape is supported by her contradictory statements, proven lies, Melanie having an alibi, etc, etc. So let's dive in. But first, something I think a few people miss out on when weighing evidence and picking sides is why it matters that Timothy contradicts her story. It's because premeditated lies are rehearsed often very poorly in one specific order. When you ask them to tell the story out of order, they often can't do it and contradictions pop up. Also, many of these contradictions in her stories are clearly lies, which makes her less trustworthy. Please keep this in mind. I need another glass of water before section two. Hey sluts, now's your chance to pee. Unless you don't need a break, in which case you can either skip to section two if you're not watching the premiere or sit here while I tell you about the book I wrote. It's called Cry for the Devil. It will be partially illustrated between chapters and it's coming out November of this year. Pre-order links will be posted sometime in September. Here's the book description if you haven't heard it yet. <clears throat> Have you ever wondered about that one guy who's unlucky enough to witness a murder? That's what happens to William Keenon Yeds Brown when he decides to be brave and check on a cute drunk girl who might be walking alone at night. Fortunately for the goth girlfriend that shut-ins like William dream about, her boyfriend, darn, was there to save her from an unknown attacker. It looks like he killed the attacker in defense, but William starts to doubt their intentions when the killer covers up the crime and kidnaps him instead of calling the police like a normal person. 
His captors are already Constantino, social media influencer and idiot heiress to a conglomerate company, and Elisha Walker, a man who paradoxically shrouds himself in mystery while talking like he's hooked up to a lie detector. Now that he's stuck with his new friends indefinitely, only one thing is certain. His life is about to get interesting. Thanks for listening. You can read a preview of this book in the back of 10 years of sketching if you're interested in scans of my sketchbooks. Um, note that my sketchbook will be uncensored and very graphic, so I, I guess that's a win for some people, but what I'm saying is uh, it's recommended 18 and up. A lot of people are under the false impression that I've included the entire first chapter, but it's actually just the first 25 pages or some shit like that. It's because of the way I format the chapters. You see, I start the story where the action starts, but the first chapter is still pretty long because I arrange chapters by the dates they happen, and a lot happens on the night William is kidnapped. Though, now that I think about that, since it happens late at night and runs through the wee hours of the morning, I do kind of disregard the exact spot the day turns. They end up at Waffle House at like 5 a.m. and run into a cop. It's great. I mean, bad day for all three of them, but their misery is your entertainment. You can follow Aretti on Instagram at BattyBabyX and Elijah on Twitter at Elijah J. Walker. And now, you can also follow William Brown on Facebook, is what I would say if they didn't deactivate my account. Ah! Fuckers. Well, I hope everyone's done peeing. Break over. Next bathroom break will be at the end of section four if you didn't get to go. Now let's get back to diving through this dumpster fire. Section 2. Lies, Inconsistencies, and Head Scratchers in the Twitter Statement. Now's where the real fun begins. 1. There's something majorly off from the get-go. As many survivors have pointed out, the purpose of hashtag MeToo is to help other women grow by sharing experiences and making it more obvious to meninists that sexual assault and harassment run rampant in Hollywood. Timmy herself even says that she did it to help people, but there's nothing in there that indicates such until the very last paragraph which doesn't fit in. Unlike most Me Too tweets, this is an accusation, is self-focused, and is structured like a persuasive essay. The majority of the last page is dedicated to directing the narrative and telling you what to believe. There are multiple instances where she even talks about her concerns about being believed. And of course, she's been using it for clout, which is something rape victims simply don't do. I mean, what if I told you you could be famous and people would buy your music, but you'd have to be known for your trauma and nothing else, you'd have to constantly talk about it and be reminded of your darkest days, and that even if people were talking about your music, they'd be thinking about you being raped, and they'd buy your music not because it's good, but because they felt sorry for you. Doesn't sound like a good deal, does it? So, for a lot of people, especially survivors, this is enough to think she's lying. For everyone else, I have about 20 more pages to read. Number 2. The way the text reads indicates this was meant to be both a story and an accusation all along, contrary to her claims that she didn't originally intend to name the abuser. Otherwise, certain lines wouldn't be in there. Like, quote, If you begin to doubt the abuse taking place in this story, I beg you to imagine her role in this being a man. But A. If no one knew this was about Melanie, no one would care enough to doubt it, and B. If it were the truth, why is the whole thing set up in a way to convince you it happened? Also, contrary to her claims that she wasn't going to name who it was about, the statement contains plenty of information to identify Melanie with. When she said best friend and talked about how she was famous, who were we supposed to think this was about? Abigail Breslin? Does anyone even know who that is? Number three, even more indications this was going to be an accusation all along, despite her claims. The Newsweek interview came out the following day, where she released supposed proof that Melanie did it. When did you tell Newsweekly about it? When did that happen? Was it, like, after you, let, like, tweeted about it, or was it a month ago? It was after. They hit oh, me up after they told the story. Yeah. Oh. I don't know why I thought you told them earlier. That was my bad. 
things don't move that fast in the publishing world, even online. That means she reached out to Newsweek before posting her story online and that she had all this stuff already put together. Unless you expect me to believe that they did all the planning for the article, all the preparations for the interview, gathering all the pictures, etc., etc., on opposite ends of the country across two different time zones, Timmy being in California and Newsweek being in New York, and then writing, coding, and posting the article all in one day. Sounds like Timmy was just trying to avoid suspicion from the get-go, which is something only a liar would bother with. Number four, her use of fragments. This may seem like an odd point, so let me explain. By omitting subjects from her sentence, she's distancing her statement from the lie. This has some overlap with the next point, so let's just move on. Number five, passive language. Liars often use passive voice and indirect language to distance themselves from the lie. For example, she doesn't say Melanie silenced her, she says, I was silenced. She doesn't say, Melanie talked about the appearance of her boobs, she said, she began talking about the appearance of my boobs. She doesn't say, Melanie made her feel guilty, she said, I was made to feel guilty. She doesn't say there were endless incidents like this, she instead delivers a fragment, endless incidents like this. She doesn't say, Melanie raped her with a sex toy. She says, I was penetrated with a sex toy. As a matter of fact, she refers to the implication Melanie molested her as oral sex, completely divorcing any reference of rape from the sentence where she is supposedly describing a rape until the very last clause where she adds, without being asked, which is, again, very vague language. Timothy saves active voice for when she's really trying to drive the central point home. Just so there is no confusion, I was molested by my best friend. That last page marks a very sudden transition from passive to active voice, like she's writing the conclusion to a persuasive essay and wants to make sure everyone's convinced in the end. Number six. It goes off topic a lot, talking about what a bad friend Melanie was. It even begins by saying specifically, when faced with a friend who really needed help though, I can honestly say she let me down completely. The alleged behavior Timothy talks about is not abusive, even in context, and is irrelevant to the subject, and petty drama is not on par with being a rapist. If it bothered her enough to put in a story about assault, it's probably the only thing in that statement that's true, or at least true from Timothy's perspective. If I was going to share my experience with my abusive ex to help women, for example, I wouldn't be complaining about his selfishness. The time he refused to drive me home because he was mad at me for living far away, like I could change that, so I had to call my father and have him drive 45 minutes to pick me up, 45 minutes back to my house, and then drive himself back to his house, all because my then boyfriend was a lazy ass prick, is not something I'd be talking about. I'd be warning everyone what to look out for by cutting straight to the red flags. I mean, it's a red flag that he's inconsiderate, but not necessarily a sex offender. But enough about me. If Timothy doesn't have anything traumatic to talk about, excluding her alleged rape itself, that's probably because that's the worst stuff that ever happened to her. Also remember that all relationships have their challenges. If I tried hard enough and had the motive, I could whip some of the best friendships I've ever had into abusive nightmares in a way similar to Timothy. For example, when Timothy implies Melanie would make her feel guilty for having panic attacks and ruining Mel's day, it could just be Timothy's perspective on a situation where Melanie feels drained from a clingy friend who has a lot of problems and goes straight to her for panic attacks even though she probably has a lot of other friends she could talk to. That was all for illustrative purposes, of course. I have no way of guaranteeing that's what actually happened. But if I had to guess what happened there, it would probably be something like that. Again, borderlines tend to have imagined abandonment issues and worry about being a burden. Melanie may have thought she wasn't saying anything hurtful, whereas Timothy's PPD caused her to see it in a warped way that was hurtful. Or maybe Melanie was just being a bitch, but that still doesn't make her a rapist, so moving on. Number seven. As I stated earlier, Timothy calls Melanie her ex-best friend, but Melanie had the same best friend since her childhood in New York City where she was raised. That friend was not Timothy, but Jacqueline Molina. Have I been pronouncing that right? God, I hope so. Timothy has called Melanie her best friend on social media, but never the other way around. 
Also, she's also called Abigail Breslin her best friend, which kind of discredits her claims that Melanie is her best friend, truly, since you can only have one best friend. That's precluded by the meaning of the word best. It seems that this best friendship was very one-sided, and Timothy must have known that, at least looking back after the friendship ended. Why is this little white lie important, you ask? Claiming she was raped by her best friend adds intimacy and horror to her tragic tale of woe. It even starts out by emphasizing that Melanie was her best friend, and how could anyone, let alone her best friend, do something like that? Nice hook to use throughout a persuasive essay. Number eight. Sketchy wording that may surprise you. Liars are more often to use words like honestly. I can honestly say she let me down completely. Now this alone isn't enough to prove she's lying, but combining this statement with her hesitance to directly state that Melanie did any of the things that follow this sentence, it's unlikely that Melanie was actually a bad friend. She had to state it in order to imply it afterward, but out of anxiety, it would be interpreted as a lie, since it is one, she added the word honestly. Number nine. Timothy said they were smoking weed together. We are both high. Weed is sometimes used to loosen someone up, to make them easier to rape, the same way as certain other drugs, but if that were really her plan, Melanie would not have smoked weed with her. It turns you into a lazy giggle box who gets the munchies and falls asleep. Number 10. Despite popular anti-pop propaganda, weed does not make you violent, it makes you mellow. So the idea that Melanie went from asking permission to hitting a blunt and deciding to rape her friend are zero. While marijuana does have effects on the libido, they are irrelevant because rape is a violent crime, not a sexual activity. Something Timothy and her friends do not seem to understand. This is for yeah. It's not like fucking Melanie like stabbed Timothy. It's like it was it's really fucked up, but rape isn't always holding someone down and doing something. It's like a mental thing. It's an abuse of power. And people who don't know that need to read more about this. If that's not enough for you, Timothy states in her Newsweek interview that smoking weed was something they did regularly, yet this is the only time Melanie supposedly had this reaction. Number 11. Head Scratcher. Timothy claims she had no evidence in her statement, and in a live stream on October 5th, 2018, she claims sh there wouldn't have been any DNA evidence. I don't think we even there even would have been DNA evidence considering clearly she wasn't thinking about it very hard because basically everyone knows that a rape leaves behind dna evidence ever heard of a rape kit or wonder what's in it and in her statement recall that she says melanie used a tool to rape her what happened to the sex toy she was allegedly assaulted with did it just evaporate i mean the statement is already so detailed I'd like to know why she can't produce the sex toy, doesn't think the cops would be able to find it, or why this sex toy somehow has neither Melanie's fingerprints nor traces of Timothy's vajuses. I could have put it in a less colorful way, but you get it. If this is something that actually happened, though, she shouldn't have to use abstract reasoning to realize the sex toy would be evidence because she would have memory to consult. Other things that would count as evidence include the photo that she claimed was from that night, any joints they smoked, the Valentine's Lovers kit, eyewitness accounts like the person at the thrift store, etc., etc. It's almost like she knows her own proofs are bullshit. Number 12, another head scratcher. She says she was penetrated by a sex toy. So not only do we have passive voice, but we have an otherwise detailed portion of narrative with no indication what kind of sex toy penetrated her. That's one part of the statement where you'd expect there to surely be details. Also, what did the sex toy use to penetrate her? No, I'm just kidding. I, I know what she meant, or at least what she wanted to infer. I'm just poking at the wording again. Number 13. The sleepover lasted two nights, but with a break in between where Timothy had to go to work in the morning. That means, after feeling uncomfortable the first night, she came back for round two, as if anyone would do that. I recall previously using this as one of my points in the Tim vid, and I still stand by it. 
It's not hard to make up an excuse to not come to a sleepover. If you're not adequately convinced using that she was in denial excuse, let me reopen some of my old wounds because I hate myself and I want to die. The morning after what happened to me, I was also in denial, and when my ex asked if I wanted to stay in his apartment all day and wait for him to come back to work, my obedient, downtrodden mouth wanted to say yes, and I opened my mouth to say yes, but my survival instinct was to do anything I could to get out of that apartment, grateful for an excuse to finally leave without him pinning me down. That's because no matter how much I consciously wanted to keep acting like nothing was wrong and I was happy and totally pumped for the second night, my survival instincts were not playing around with my games. You cannot consciously control your amygdala. It's an automatic process. If you could just ignore it, I'd have far fewer panic attacks. Yes, I eventually twisted it into thinking I was in control all along and I I can't talk about this anymore. Never mind. Moving on. I need water. Number 14. She says on page 3 that she has a hard time saying no to Melanie, but says on pages 2, 3, and 4 that she said no to sex repeatedly. Sounds like it was pretty easy, or at least not so hard that it prevented her from saying no under pressure. Such as, for example, returning to a sleepover you didn't want to go to to begin with, or smoking a joint you didn't want. Number 15. She states in the conclusion of page 4 that silence does not equal consent and that it was hard for her to convince herself of this. But wait! Wasn't the claim that she wasn't silent? Again, on pages 2, 3, and 4, she says she said no to sex repeatedly, which is true. Number 16. She states that it's hard to convince herself that she was raped, but since posting this statement has been very insistent that she was raped. She is always on the aggressive when people question her story and has behaved that way from the beginning. Someone who doubted that they were truly raped would not react in an antagonistic fashion. All the hate comments would make a real victim of this mindset doubt themselves. Timothy, on the other hand, shows no signs of ever wavering and refuses to accept even neutrality. Number 17. The statement is very lengthy and includes details that make it uncomfortable yet unbelievable. In the Tim vid, I gave a rather quick explanation of this, simply using fake excuse notes from school kids as an example. Real parents' notes were short, whereas kids added in a bunch of unnecessary details in an attempt to make them look more convincing. It's a little more complicated than that, really. It is at least a proven fact that rehearsed liars sprinkle in a bunch of details to make their stories look more realistic, whereas someone who's telling the truth has no reason to add extra details because they don't need to convince you a true statement is real. But the unnecessary details alone don't make it a lie. Someone who's telling the truth may, for example, recall something unrelated as they're giving an unrehearsed verbal statement. This is because they are going through their memories. However, Timothy's statement was pre-planned, written, and structured like a persuasive essay. Remember what I said earlier about how liars put effort into convincing you that they're telling the truth? All signs point to lie. Not to mention, given the subject at hand is one that's hard to talk about, one would expect a real rape victim to avoid going into extraneous details on something that's hard to talk about. Number 18. MLU, or Main Length of Utterance. Most sentences are 10 to 15 words long. Liars tend to either speak in sentences that are much longer or much shorter than usual sentences. This is because of anxiety. And as I've already mentioned, Timothy's sentences are often not even sentences, but sentence fragments. You'll notice that most of the sentences or sentence fragments in her statements are either extremely long or contain eight or fewer words. On its own, this would not mean much to me, but again, there's all the evidence I've already mentioned, and of course, even more evidence is to follow. Number 19. Melanie has an alibi for the dates of the alleged rape. She was in New York while Timothy was in California. Timothy always throws a fit when you bring this up, so I'm going to assume we're on to something and cover this topic in more detail later in the video. Number 20. Here's a head scratcher. It constantly asserts that Melanie held the power in their friendship, and I find it interesting because, as we've already established, Melanie was a teenager when they met. 
Timothy was a grown-ass woman. She's my age. The maturity difference between 19 and 22 may not seem like a lot, but trust me, it means the world. For fuck's sake, Timothy could legally drink and Melanie was barely a legal adult. To this day, Melanie's not even old enough to rent a car. I'm not saying it's predatorial to have friends that are younger than you, or even to have consensual sex with someone who's younger than you, just that it's weird to be submissive to your younger friends instead of parental, or at least it's weird to me. Look at this picture and tell me which of these women is shy and passive, and with Timothy being about three years older, let me ask you this, who is more likely to have influenced whom? Who is older and more experienced in life? Which of them could buy the liquor? And given their ages and legal status of weed at the time and in the state each of the girls came from, who probably introduced it to whom? Weed was legalized for recreational use in Oregon back in 2014, whereas New York is still fighting for the right to toke in their downtime. The political environments are totally different. Again, this is just a head-scratcher, not hard evidence or contradiction, but it's weird enough to be worth thinking about. Also, Melanie stated previously that her first time smoking weed was at a friend's sleepover. She was against it, but her friend pressured her into it. Could this have been about Timothy? Did Timothy flip the script to protect herself if this got out? I'd say so. Number 21. In her statement, Timothy claims that sex is hard for her to talk about because of sexual abuse. However, a lot of the things she's posted on social media indicate otherwise. You may be thinking, why would she lie about this? Well, to make Melanie sound even worse and to make her story more believable. Section 3. Lies, Contradictions, and Head Scratchers in Timothy's Additional Statements and Amendments. Unfortunately, we are not done yet. Timothy also did an interview with Newsweek the following day in which she divulged more information. <coughs> Excuse me, hiccup. Later, Timothy stated during an interview that they went to a thrift store and found a silly sex game, her words, the day of the alleged rape and that said rape occurred while they were playing this game. And that that's when this picture was supposedly taken. In her later interview with this 15-year-old girl, Timothy adds that she herself had the idea to play this game. Yeah, or no, the one with the handcuffs. What's that? <laughs> oh, okay. So that day we had gone to a thrift store and there was just this like silly, like old, like kit that was like a feather tickler and like handcuffs and like those dice that say like, kiss leg and those things and i was like oh my god that's so funny like let's get it you know uh but then we started playing it and i was like doing funny rolls on the dice you know like lick elbow but then she like you know wanted yeah. to as <laughs> on yeah yikes <sighs> number one why the hell would you play a bondage game with a blindfold and handcuffs with someone who is trying to pressure you into sex that you didn't want to have? It doesn't make any sense. It's just not a probable situation. It sounds like something from a fanfic. Especially when you consider the, the fact that Timothy claims it was her idea to buy it. Who the fuck wants to play a sex game with someone who's trying to pressure them into sex? What the fuck? And don't even tell me two adult bisexual women never talked about sex before that sleepover. It's clear that Timothy felt comfortable with Melanie or else she would not engage her in BDSM play. BDSM is a common kink. BND stands for bondage and discipline. DNS stands for dominance and submission. And S and M stands for sadism and masochism. I've also heard slave and master for S and M. Timothy's interest in picking up this game is more evidence that their encounter was consensual. After all, why would you ask someone to play a sex game with you if not to have a fun, sexy time? Number 2. Head Scratcher During the Newsweek interview, Timothy said that the rape happened while they were playing this silly sex game. However, there was no mention of this whatsoever in her original statement. Strange, considering how detailed it was. Number three, contradiction. Again, in the Newsweek interview, she claims it happened while they were playing this game. But in her original statement, she says on pages two through three, 
that she was trying to sleep while Melanie raped her. These two statements don't fit together even slightly. The picture clearly shows that Melanie's on the other side of a table, not in bed. Like you could fall asleep while playing a sex game. Number 4. Contradiction in the Newsweek article, Timothy claims Melanie convinced her to play the sex game. However, in the interview with the 15-year-old girl, she said it was her own idea to buy the sex game. Things, And I was like, oh my god, that's so funny. Like, let's get it, you know? Number five. How is Melanie in bondage gear proof that she raped anyone? Hint, it isn't. This picture is just another surface detail Timothy included in an attempt to make her story more believable. But in this case, she's done the opposite. Number six. This photograph on its own paints a very different picture than what Timothy is trying to present. Just like in any real world scenario, the person wearing handcuffs is not going to be dominant over the one who put them in cuffs. They are submissive. In this picture, Melanie is shown handcuffed and blindfolded. This indicates that she is in the submissive or victim role, depends on the type of play. Also, don't ask me how I know that. So basically, what I'm saying is, anyone with even a surface level understanding of this kink knows that Melanie is not taking on the role a rapist would gravitate toward. The type of rape Timothy describes is about hate, control, sadism, and power. And I think it was just kind of a weird power thing. I don't really think it had anything to do with her sexuality. So why would someone who is attracted to those things play the victim role? They wouldn't. But luckily, we don't even have to rely on this anymore, because I found the game on Amazon, and now I know the rules. Number seven, the kit, which is called the Valentine's Lover's Kit, also contains a door hanger and a tickler. Timothy didn't give the rules for the sex game probably because it would expose her, so I'll go ahead and tell you. One wears the blindfold, the other rolls the dice to reveal the action of love each turn. So basically what this picture really shows is Melanie sitting there blindfolded and handcuffed awaiting Timothy to do whatever sexual things the dice tells her to do. Interesting that Timothy picked this game out, especially since her statement asserts that she has been previously sexually abused and that talking about sex is hard for her. This game is obviously very sexual in nature. The words I can make out on the action dice are tickle, kiss, lick, and rub. As for the body part dice, I can see back, toe, and leg. My guess is, remember the part in the original Timothy Twitter story where Melanie kept asking Timothy permission to touch her arms, her boobs, etc.? It was probably while they were playing this stupid game. So basically, Timothy picks out the game, plays it, and then cries sexual harassment. Looks like someone rolled lick toe and regretted it. Number 8. This one was basically handed to us by Newsweek. Timothy says she tried to help me early on in my career, but all that means is she'd occasionally suggest we write a song together. However, Newsweek mentions right after that Timothy's band opened for Melanie Martinez in 2014. That means that Melanie exposed Timothy to loads of new fans. There were dozens of captive audiences forced to stand there and listen to the dresses. Opening for an already established act that everyone there wanted to see and was in a good mood for is a lot of good publicity, and it wasn't anything Melanie was obligated to give her, at least not if they were truly ever friends and Timothy wasn't just using her all along. Number 9. Head Scratcher. In the interview, she doesn't refer to what's her name as the other girl Melanie raped. Maddie, the other girl who slept with her. Melanie dumped her, too. She refers to her as the other girl Melanie had sex with. Hmm. That's a pretty clear implication that she had sex with Melanie and it just flowed out of her mouth just like that. Number 10. Another Newsweek error, or perhaps just a head scratcher. This photo is supposedly from them being on tour in 2014, but the photo was tweeted on March 4th, 2015. That's nearly a year later. If you just reunited with Melanie Martinez, your best friend, would you not take a new selfie with her? After all, as I'll go over later, Timothy values and desires fame. Number 11, head scratcher. The photo of this moment somehow ended up on Instagram. February 19th, 2017. That's 10 months before Timothy made the allegations. Looks like Timothy Snapchatted it at some point with the caption OMFG. 
That's a weird way to caption your trauma. Not that it's normal to Snapchat your trauma. But I'm pretty sure it was just pictures, maybe a Snapchat. And all it was was the fucking game. That's it. There's no reason to release those. But wait, wasn't this supposed to be a never-before-seen picture? Either way, something smells fishy, so I'm just putting this out there. Number 12. Contradiction. Timothy claims that Melanie did not try to contact her directly. She also claims that she did try to contact her, but she blocked her. Which is it? Number 13. The contradiction that really kills me. This photograph, according to a video on a tweet on December 30th, was not taken on the dates of the alleged rape or anywhere near it. It was taken on May 6, 2015 at 9.50 p.m. More on this later, since Timmy claims this isn't true, but it's pretty self-explanatory. Timmy is claiming that this photograph, taken on May 6th, is a picture of an event that happened on June 25th. Because fuck logic. Section 4. The timeline makes no fucking sense. Timothy's claims leave a timeline that has more plot holes than season 6 Pretty Little Liars. Timothy and Melanie became friends in early 2014. June 21st, 2015, a picture is posted of Timothy at a pool party in Los Angeles. A video is recorded of Melanie performing in New York. June 24th, 2015, Timothy posts the LA pool party picture. This is the day Timothy claims the sleepover started. At this time, Melanie was still in New York City. It's extremely likely that in between the 21st when this picture was taken to the 24th when the sleepover started, Timmy traveled to New York City. But we don't need to rely on that because Timothy's own statement already says she was in LA. Like she said, she had to get up and go to work in the morning. She lived in L.A., so her job was almost definitely in L.A. since she worked at an ice cream shop called Salt and Straw, and therefore the sleepover was in L.A. But you know who wasn't in L.A.? Melanie. That means she had an alibi. And before someone goes, Oh, how do you know she didn't just plan ahead and pretend to be in New York because she planned on raping Timothy? <laughs> Here's a video of her performing at the Webster Hall in New York City three days prior. Since she's a New York native, she probably stopped to visit family before leaving. Also, there's a lot of work to do after you close a tour. And since she was an introvert, she was surely exhausted. It's doubtful she was lying about being in New York. Timothy, of course, gets defensive every time you bring this alibi up, so I'm thinking we're on to something. And if you're talking about the dates, I don't even want to fucking talk. <laughs> I shouldn't have named a date. Otherwise, she wouldn't care. Also on this day, she posts a selfie of herself while on the toilet. It's not really relevant. I just thought everyone should know that the day before her supposed rape, all she caught evidence of was a steaming shit. June 25th, 2015. According to the Newsweek interview, this is the date the rape happened. On this day, Melanie was still in New York, boarding a plane to Los Angeles, according to this selfie. This flight takes about six to seven hours if everything runs smoothly, which it never does. Not that that detail matters, considering how she couldn't have possibly attended the sleepover in California the day prior while she was in New York. So Timothy's dates were already wrong. Check your math next time, sis. Anyway, this is supposedly a photo from that night. Notice Melanie's hair. I'll be talking about it quite a bit. June 26, 2015, the day after the alleged rape. According to footage of Timothy's iCloud, this is an actual date they hung out. Also on that day, Timothy posts a picture of her dressed up like her rapist. Now deleted. Uh -huh. Gotcha. Yeah. June 29, 2015, another picture, although Melanie is only in a fraction of it. 
The first time I saw it, I didn't even understand how it was proof of anything. But we can tell it's Melanie because we can see her tattoo reversed in the mirror. This was taken on June 26th. We know this because of Timothy's iCloud. Here we can see Melanie with hair that mysteriously grew like four inches overnight and became blonde. In the Tim vid, one of my points was that it's impossible to bleach the color out of your hair like that, and I knew that from experience. You have to wait for that color to fade out and then dye over it or wait for it to grow out and cut it off. A lot of people are asking what color was Mel's hair when it happened. I don't okay. think why that's a question. She wears wigs literally like for every single concert. Right. right. Good question, Timmy. Allow me to explain. Her natural hair color helps us sort out the timeline you loathe so much. Also, I wear wigs and can tell the difference between a wig and natural hair. That ain't a wig. And before someone suggests it's a human hair wig, her hair in this picture looks like the same shade of blonde and more importantly, the same texture as it was when she was performing on The Voice. Also, no wig maker who's worth a shit will buy bleached or dyed hair. Besides, why would a cisgender woman with pretty easily manageable hair like that wear a wig while she's bumming around with friends? And judging by their outfits, they weren't playing dress up. The fact that this is her real hair makes the date Timmy claims the sex game was played is impossible. This picture was probably taken on May 2015. You can see Melanie had the same hair color on her birthday and she cut her hair by mid-May. By mid-June, it appears she's dyed her hair a darker shade of blonde, probably to hide the bluish tint still in her hair. It looks a little damaged, so she may have tried to strip out the color. Also, she posted a picture on Instagram on May 6th of herself in the same outfit, except in this one, she's wearing a wig instead of her natural hair. She could have taken it off the night when they were going about their day, and all bathroom selfies were accounted for. Wigs are about as comfortable as bras. I'm thinking this image was taken on May 6, 2015 at 9.50 p.m. After all, that's what Timothy's iCloud says. Don't believe me? Watch the video yourself before she deletes the tweet. Leave it to Timothy Heller to release her own proof that she's lying and then claim it's proof she's telling the truth. Confused? After nearly a month of claiming that she got the dates wrong because of the dates in her camera roll or trauma or whatever, she changes her story and claims her iCloud is messed up. I don't see how. She follows up with a photo of the pool party which says June 24th, whereas we know the picture was taken on or before June 21st because that's when her friend posted it. But really, all that means is that June 24th is the day she saved it to her camera roll and it was automatically backed up by her iCloud. It's the day she posted it, so it makes sense that it's also the day she saved it. She wasn't the one who took the picture clearly, so that means someone had to have sent it to her for her to save it. Seems to me her iCloud is working just fine and she just doesn't like what it says. Why else begin the tweet with, IDK if I'm gonna regret posting this. Pro tip, if you're going to regret posting something, don't post it. October 19th, 2015, goes to her rapist's house again four months later and wears her rapist's wig again, deleted when people started to question her about it. Also note that this is the original date in an interview where she claims the friendship ended. April 6th, one year later, they are still friends. Timothy cosplays Melanie, her alleged rapist, again. His Instagram post has since been, you guessed it, deleted. October 2016, this is when Melanie supposedly dumped Timothy. 
She initially says 2015 after a lengthy pause checking her phone, but when the interviewer questions her, she changes it to 2016. It was in October. Must have been of 2015. October 2015. Oh, so you guys were... Fr well, because a lot of people have been posting some of the recreation pics, and, like, some of them were... For oh, wait, no. Sorry. It's gotta, it's gotta be 2016, then. Not that it matters, because January 27th, 2017, on Curious Cat, someone asked Timothy if she's still friends with Melanie, and she replied, yes. She deleted the original ask and or her account on Curious Cat sometime between her posting the statement and me making this video, but she forgot to delete the auto-tweet. Whoops. Wonder why she's covering this up? Well, it's because she claims on page 4 of her statement that she stopped being friends with Melanie after the assault. Clearly she didn't, at least not any time soon after the sexual assault like her statement implies. The part where I say it must have been 2016, I was referring to when Melanie decided to stop being my friend. Their friendship ending had to have been a pretty fresh wound because... In March 2017, there's another curious cat from Timothy that's similar, except now instead of confirming their friends, she says she's busy. It was deleted, but I found a screenshot. The lyrics of Piggyback say, Now I'm 22 years old and I've had a crazy year of isolation from all the plastic people here. I'd say sometime around February or March is when she dumped Timothy. I'm especially leaning toward February because it's Grammy season in LA. It makes sense that Melanie would consult a psychic about winning a Grammy during Grammy season. And again, according to Timothy, Melanie dumped her because the psychic told her she needed to cut people out of her life. Which is pretty sound advice, really. Cut toxic people out of your life and focus on your work. Makes me think that Timothy might not have been that great a friend, and the psychic could see that. Anyway... December 4th, 2017, that same year, is when she tweeted her statement. So as you can tell, Timothy's version of the timeline does not add up to events that are shown otherwise. Now, I can tell Timothy fans aren't very creative because I keep seeing the same excuse to cover this up from those few who actually care that Melanie has an alibi. I keep seeing people say, Timothy just got the dates wrong because of trauma. Trauma, my ass. And the exact date something happened doesn't matter. It's another unnecessary detail that she sprinkled in to make it look more realistic, and that's the point. The fact that the date is impossible is just icing on the idiom cake. Like I said in my last video, when people embellish a story with unnecessary details, it's usually a lie. When confronted with giving the wrong date, she was just like, Okay, so the only reason that I told Newsweek that it was on the 25th is because I remember posting that picture of me with the half black and half purple uh, wig the day after. This is also a lie and you don't even need to read her body language to figure that one out because the photo could not have been taken on that date because if Melanie wasn't in California to start the sleepover on the 24th, likewise the sleepover did not start two days before the picture was taken. Unless, of course, you expect me to believe that Melanie has harnessed the powers of quantum superposition. Also, she later changes the story and claims her iCloud is messed up. So if Timmy can't even tell the truth about why she got the dates wrong, why should I believe her? I'm a drunk, not an idiot. And devil's advocate, even if she wasn't lying about why she got the dates wrong, is there any point in listening to someone who tries to pass off a guess as a concrete date in her statement instead of just not including irrelevant details like a normal person? Or like herself on August 26, 2015 when someone asked her how long she knew Melanie? You don't think that that's even slightly suspicious behavior? If you didn't know the exact date when something happened and it was just a surface detail that didn't matter, would you include an exact date or move on and put in a general time frame? Don't lie to me. Which is more likely? Whatever bullshit excuse you were about to pull out of your ass to explain her esoteric victim behaviors or the fact that she f***ing lied. I rest my case. Also, her claims that she forgot the dates because of trauma don't really hold up so well when you remember that she was high as a kite the whole time and THC can really f*** with your memories. 
Between that and the fact that trauma made her forget the one thing she should have remembered, she should have remembered far less than what she claims to. Also, if her trauma was really to that extent, I'd expect her to act far more traumatized. Other questionable behavior. I've shown it to you before and now you're going to watch it again just one more time. Bunch of other fucked up shit. I'm kind of out of breath right now. Just saw you dancing, but I, my, my goal is not to put Melanie in jail. And I know that that's not a realistic goal. And even if it was, I wouldn't want to. It's not what I did this for. Yeah. It's not like fucking Melanie, like, stabbed Timothy. It's like, it was, it's really fucked up, but rape isn't always holding someone down and doing something. It's like a mental thing. It's an abuse of power. And people who don't know that need to read more about this. Yeah, thank you. You want to make her career bad? No, we literally don't care. That's literally just she ruined her career. She should have a lot of people don't want to relive. For those of you who were silently cursing me for using a clip of her friend speaking, note that Timothy's silence and alliance with this person is both implicit agreement and an affirmation of her stance. Rape is, as I've seen previously, is a physical thing just as much as it is mental. The allegation was that Melanie sexually assaulted Timothy orally and then penetrated her using a sex toy. That's very physical. I firmly believe that rape and assault or even murder are not similar enough to determine whether one is worse than the other, but I can tell you right now I'd rather be stabbed and the very idea of rape not being all that bad just because it doesn't leave a physical wound is laughable. And the idea that rape isn't severe enough for it to be worth pursuing justice is absolutely hilarious. 
Because rape is not just about feeling violated. It's about being truly violated inside and out. It's a terrible feeling, and if Melanie were a rapist, then it would absolutely be worth calling the police over. Not just for justice, but to protect other women. Timothy and Eve are just trying and failing to appeal to the people who don't believe Timothy because of her hesitance to punish Melanie. They're trying to make it look like rape isn't a big deal to justify Timothy's behavior. But if rape isn't that big of a deal, it's not like she stabbed Timothy after all, then there shouldn't be a problem with being a Melanie fan. And while they claim this mindset in this clip, Timothy's other statements don't match up with her nonchalant attitude in this clip. Number two, speaking of Eve, I find their behavior especially repulsive because it reminds me of those mean girls who bully you and spread rumors behind your back in school. This is not how you talk about the person who raped and abused your best friend. This is how you talk about someone you're jealous of. Plus, Timothy is totally fine with it and agreeing with them. It's safe to say that this isn't unusual behavior for Eve. I'm going to post some things that they've said about Melanie. Pause to read. It was a hard read for me because I was bullied in middle school and it sounds just like the girls that... Ugh, no, I'm not letting this video go into personal territory. Just saying reading this broke what's left of my charcoal heart. Eve is like 23. Time to get your head out of high school. Though I'd expect no less from a woman who shared lewd pictures of herself on a group chat with minors. Ew. Number three. This will surprise no one. Timothy has previously accused her bandmates of the dresses of abuse, saying that she only stayed with them for so long because they needed her voice. This would be more believable if the band's own fans didn't hate her voice so much. She got... Tons of hate comments that weren't directed toward the other members. That had to hurt her self-esteem. A band where people made me feel really shitty at what I love to do, so now if I'm in a bad place, like writing, kind of, if I'm anxious, I, make, I doubt myself a lot. And it's hard for me to feel good about what I'm writing. Number four. The fact that Timothy allowed a 15-year-old girl to interview her to begin with, this is highly inappropriate. An adult woman should know better than to do something like that, and she should have never so much as guested her during the live. Unlike Nylon or Newsweek, this girl didn't have any connections, so the only logical reason Timothy would come up with the idea to get on you now and have this girl interview her is because she knew it would be easier to manipulate a teenage girl in a live interview than someone who actually knew what they were doing. It's disgusting. And before you claim Timothy didn't know she was young, she first invited her to a live before getting on you now and you can tell she's underage just by looking at her. I know I'm not showing you her face, but trust me, you can tell she's underage just by looking. Number five, Timothy fired shots at Billie Eilish, a minor whose fame does not change the fact that she's underage. The reason? Because she's so overly sexualized and hangs out with adult male rappers. The scandal! So what's the real reason? Well, probably because Billie is a Melanie fan who used to believe Timothy and doesn't anymore. I talked about this in a previous video, but I'll let Billie defend herself this time. Ho. Oh. Fuck you just call me ho bro ho what the fuck is up with this dog like i couldn't like she's sexualized i'm couldn't be less sexual i swear to god like do you see the shit that i wear have you ever seen my skin from beyond this point up besides right now wow that's way lower than i thought it was but like i'm dead ass like have you even seen my shoulders ever ever also, this situation is highly hypocritical because Timmy was born in August 1992 and her friend Abigail in April 1996. That's four years. And if Abigail was 16, that would make Timothy about 20. The fact that she's a woman and not a rapper shouldn't make a difference. Because women are not incapable of rape, something she doesn't understand nearly as well as she claims to, and rapper is not synonymous with rapist. 
Am I the only one sensing some racism here? Like, I don't want to think it, but my mind just keeps pulling me to it and wondering if Timothy is using male rappers as code for black men. I'll let you decide. Number six. This one I was unlucky enough to watch unfold on Twitter. Timothy sided with Amanda. Fuck, I forgot her name. Amber. Amber Heard, you know, the one who confessed under oath to abusing Johnny Depp after lying and stating that he abused her in order to get media attention. Everyone else expressed hatred and or feelings of betrayal toward Amber for her lies, whereas Timothy expressed support. She would rather side with someone who lied about abuse and allegedly shit in her husband's bed because he was two hours late to a party than admit women can lie. She's covertly defending Amber for lying, and who would do that? Well, someone who lied about abuse. And when the truth is presented to her, she responds by deleting her tweets and saying that tweeting about facts and evidence is triggering for her. Sure. Sounds valid. Okay, let's move on. Number seven. Timmy complained about Melanie using the word crazy in her song, but does the same thing all the damn time. She's also been known to use the word psycho. Meanwhile, the Newsweek interview says, Heller said she considers herself an advocate for mental health, but watching Martinez brand herself as an ally to those with mental illness was too much hypocrisy for her to handle. What? Melanie is the hypocrite here? Really? Alright. Sure. Number eight, Timothy has the following complaint referencing Mad Hatter. I want to spread awareness about mental illness and not just write songs about like crazy people, you know, like it's like <laughs> it's offensive to people who are actually called crazy, you know, when I know that she is extremely neurotypical. The first is that she loves Mad Hatter and was totally fine with it before when she was friends with Melanie. As a matter of fact, it's safe to say she's fine with it now since she liked this Instagram post and then unliked it when people noticed. My second major problem with this statement is that she, a supposed mental health advocate, A, trashes people who don't have mental illnesses like they're an undeserving population who never experiences any kind of strife, and B, misuses the word neurotypical. A neurotypical is someone who's not neurodivergent, in layman's terms, someone who doesn't have a developmental disorder. So autism, ADHD, DCD, etc. Not only is she using the word wrong anyway, but I also haven't found any instances of her saying she has a developmental disorder. Borderline personality disorder is not a developmental disorder, it's a personality disorder. I did find a 2017 tweet through Wayback Machine where she said she was prescribed with Adderall and had withdrawal symptoms after running out. At Timothy Heller. So, I've been prescribed with Adderall and was basically taking it daily, not abusing it at all, and I forgot to refill my prescription, so I hadn't had it for a couple of days, and I feel super shitty. Could these be withdrawal symptoms, or does that usually not happen? No med shaming, PLZ, dot dot. Well, I'll answer your question, Timmy, since no one else did. It is normal. If you don't have ADHD, but take the medicine for it anyway. This is something that only happens when you take ADHD medicine and don't have ADHD as people with ADHD just revert back to normal functioning. So it's doubtful that she has ADHD. She probably has no claim to this struggle and my theory seemed confirmed by her conflicting reports of an official diagnosis. And basically the psychiatrist went over them with me and she said, so you should definitely not be put on Adderall because you don't have ADD and it would probably make it a lot worse because all of your signs are pointing to borderline personality disorder and not ADD. No doctor is going to prescribe you with Adderall after deciding you don't have ADHD because it's a controlled substance and she could lose her medical license, so I'm guessing Timmy got it on the street. 
And even if she did have ADHD, which again, I doubt, but can disprove because I'm not her doctor, the way she's using the word is still wrong, both literally and morally. She's using it not as a means to relate with neurodivergent people, but to trash those with healthier brains. As if your life is perfect if you have a healthy brain and you're not allowed to have or talk about your problems. This is not the behavior or attitude of someone who wants to help others recover, and I do not approve. Number 9. More on her claims that she spoke out against Melanie because of mental health advocacy. The way she ranted about Eugenia Cooney last year is pretty clear proof she isn't one. Pressuring other people to speak about their illnesses and judging them for not doing so is really uncool. This is an often fatal mental illness Timmy's playing around with. She really needs to mind her own business, and it's clear she doesn't care about Eugenia's mental health. She's just posting this to look good, clearly, because it does nothing to help Eugenia. Timothy is actually making it worse because this is kind of... This is the kind of attention that anorexics thrive on. I should know. I was diagnosed with anorexia about nine years ago. I first started starving myself when I was 12, and I didn't start eating somewhat normally until, like, midway through college. There's no encouragement quite like being told you're too skinny and having people worry about you. Thankfully, Eugenia has gotten help this year, and I guarantee you it has nothing to do with Timothy. Number 10. Timothy and her friend Abigail Breslin both support Amy Schumer, who, need I remind you all, is a rapist and made fun of her victim's penis during a speech for female empowerment nearly a year before the tweets I'm showing you. She had sex with, her words, a man who was too drunk to consent and was falling asleep so she could feel like she was valued. During her speech, she says, his penis was so soft, it felt like one of those de-stressed things that slips from your hand. Yeah. That's a pretty fucked up person to support. And during this time, I'm supposed to believe that Melanie was abusing Timothy and that her friends are so woke about it. And before you say something stupid, yes, both Timothy and Abigail are both still following Amy Schumer, a rapist. After all that campaigning they do about how girls can rape, do they really believe it? Apparently not. Number 11. Those now deleted photographs of Timothy dressed up as Melanie. As I stated in the Tim vid, I consciously avoid anything that reminds me of the man who assaulted me down to so much as eating his favorite kind of chocolate. And as I said in my video about why I hate trigger warnings, I brushed my teeth with kid's toothpaste for years just to avoid the trigger of minty breath. And as I said in the reflection I wrote, recorded, and posted while well, both drunk and high, and now kind of regret because I said some things that were a little too personal, but it's too late to go back now. The narrating character of books two through three of Cry for the Devil, the novel I'm publishing this November, Revenge kills all seven of the men who gang raped her one by one. Book three chronicles my revenge fantasies that I can never act on. The very idea of dressing up like the man who sexually assaulted me makes me want to vomit. You may respond by reminding me of Timothy's statement where she claims she still loves Melanie in a fucked up way. However, not only do her actions not show this at all, but sorry I'm not sorry, I absolutely cannot wrap my mind around the idea of loving a rapist. The woman she claims betrayed her, drugged her, violated her insides with a sex toy. That sort of thing would kill me. Something similar drove me to self-enforced celibacy for about five years now, over five years. And need I remind you that I've already proven this photo was not taken in July 25th like she claimed, but seven weeks before she was raped? There's no way this rape happened. I need water. Number 12. Head Scratcher. This picture where Timothy is playing bondage with her friends again. Or maybe this is behind the scenes of sleep, judging by the colors. I don't know, I never managed to get through the whole thing. But still, bondage. And again, in her statement, she claims that talking about sex makes her feel uncomfortable. Yet she does this. It's just weird. And if she was really raped while playing a bondage game like she claims, wouldn't this trigger the shit out of her? After all, tweeting about facts and evidence does. Number 13. Her constant war against Melanie fans. Despite claiming that she is doing this to help people and not to hurt Melanie, she is constantly trying to turn people against her. 
She expresses anger that people still love her. She grooms young fans by giving them positive reinforcement when they harass Melanie fans. This is not the behavior of someone who wants to help people grow. It's not the behavior of a mental health advocate. Number 14. Stolen fan art. Well, sorta. She took some Melanie Martinez fan art, cropped it to make it look like it was for her, and then posted it on Instagram. This is very strange. I tried putting myself in her shoes and I couldn't figure out why she'd do something like this. Perhaps this is a lack of imagination on my part, but like, what the f***? This is so antagonistic. Can you imagine one of the Me Too leaders doing this petty shit? Would Alyssa Milano post Harvey Weinstein fan art on Instagram with him cropped out? No, she wouldn't. Number 15. Timothy says she wants to be a musician, but I scrolled down years of her Twitter, and the only thing I picked up is that she wants to be famous. There are tons of tweets about becoming famous, tons of tweets about famous people, tons of selfies, but practically nothing to indicate she's a musician. This makes it more apparent to me that she's an attention seeker, not an artist. A true artist will create art no matter what. Timothy just sees music as an avenue to fame or perhaps a justification for it, and that lack of passion shows in her music. That's why she couldn't get famous for her music and resorted to a false rape accusation. Number 16, this picture of Hitler in heaven says a lot about her character. I'll just give you a few seconds to get a really good look at it, and while you're looking at it, remember that Timothy compared Melanie to Hitler in a now deleted tweet with comment. The tweet called him successful though, so I guess she doesn't hate him too much. <sighs> the coward, she retweeted, deleted this tweet, but I'll put up a link anyway and you can infer what it said by reading the comments people left. Number 17, Head Scratcher. Timothy said she shared her story on Melanie to help women. She also accused her former bandmates of abuse and said she was abused by a man in the past. Kind of makes you wonder why she shared her story about Melanie, but not the other stories. We know nothing about them at all. Is it because sharing those stories would not be profitable because those people are not famous? I think yes, since she's so clearly obsessed with fame. Number 18. She's proven through example that she has no problem scamming people. She charged $15 to give shoutouts to people, which would be fine except one person paid her the money and got nothing in return. No shoutout. This person fully admits that this happened but continued to support Timothy, which should say a lot about her fan base and their mentality. This next one is loosely related to her mental health advocacy, but also her lying, scamming nature, so I'm including in this point. She tried to trick little B into thinking she was transgender, so he'd send her money. Fuck you, Timothy. Fuck you, and fuck whoever named you Timothy. There's also theories that the GoFundMe for a person she called Haley was a scam. I don't want to go any deeper into that, though, because this video is long enough as it is. And that con- it just seems really convoluted, so moving on. Section 6. Shitting on your dumbass arguments. Number 1. Timothy had no reason to lie! Really? Not even the fact that she dropped a single to no applause and then suddenly accused someone popular of rape and now has tons of followers, companies approaching her to model their clothes on Instagram, shoutouts, etc.? This joke is getting old. It's called a publicity stunt. There's this misconception that people never lie about being raped, and it's just not true. My dying grandfather pretended a nurse aide raped him so he could get out of a nursing home he didn't like. Someone else I know, I won't say who because they were underage, pretended to be raped so her grandparents wouldn't find out she was bisexual, and then she did it again to a guy because she liked all the attention it got her the first time. Lying about rape is real and it's disgusting because it makes it harder for actual victims to get justice. Number 2. Timothy using this story for attention is not proof that her story is a lie. I disagree because this is not how a rape survivor behaves. Nobody said, oh thank god Bill Cosby raped me so now I can be famous. 
Because, you know, rape is actually traumatic. Not that she would know that. It's not like fucking Melanie, like, stabbed Timothy. It's like, it was, it's really fucked up, but rape isn't always holding someone down and doing something. It's like a mental thing. Oops, I said I'd never play it again. Oh well. Every time you talk about a traumatic experience, it reopens the wound. She should be the last person wanting to talk about it, but instead she brings it up every time she wants to gain something, be it to get back at a mean person on Twitter or to gain a friend at Nylon who will write a biased article for her and get her on Getty Images. She throws this alleged rape around like Daenerys Stormborn reminding people that she has dragons. Then of course, maybe Timothy wouldn't have to cry rape constantly if she had some other accomplishment other than ruining a good woman's reputation for a small scrap of fame. Number three. Women never lie. All rape accusations are real. In case you still don't believe my personal anecdotes, I can think of plenty of times women have lied about rape for dumber reasons, often with no clear motive. Also, Timothy Heller has been accused of rape by someone named Sierra Alberts, and I don't see you attacking either of them. Sierra's claim is very similar to Timothy's too, and I suspect it's fake. When your argument is that pathetic, it's time to find a new one. We have to stop letting people get away with lying about rape. It ruins the life of the accused, and it makes it harder for actual rape victims to be believed. Number four. Melanie's statement is a confession. No, Melanie's statement says she never said no to what we chose to do together, meaning it was a choice between the two of them to have sex. Choice indicates agency. They had consensual sex. Stop trying to warp that into a confession of guilt. You're only making yourself look stupid. Number five. That statement means Melanie is saying it's not rape if she didn't say no. First of all, no she isn't. Read more carefully. Much more carefully, since I'm the first to admit it was a poorly constructed sentence. Second of all, it's not even that relevant because Timothy claims she said no repeatedly on pages 2, 3, and 4. Melanie's statement was posted after and about Timothy's. Following suit, Melanie is denying that Timothy ever said no, reasserting that the encounter was a mutual consensual choice. Nothing you say is going to change that. Number 6. You don't know for sure what happened. You weren't there. Yeah, you know who else wasn't there? Melanie. She was in New York. God, you have a short memory. Number seven. It doesn't matter if Timothy's dates are wrong. Melanie's statement said it happened. Nice try, but Timothy didn't release the dates until after Melanie's statement on December 4th. The dates are from the Newsweek article, which was posted on December 5th. Melanie only confirmed that they had consensual sex. She didn't say when. So your argument makes no fucking sense. Number eight. But Timothy had a boyfriend. Whether or not Timothy or Melanie had a boyfriend at the time, which both did according to Timothy, is irrelevant to this fact. People cheat on their boyfriends all the damn time. And for all we know, the guys knew about it ahead of time. Timothy herself says, She's dating Miles. Oh, shit. God, I did not know that. You said you wouldn't care. The fact that she knows about this indicates that she and Melanie discussed sex prior to their encounter, which is unsurprising. People often talk about sex before having consensual sex. It's a common practice, 12 out of 10. I highly recommend talking about sex with your intended partner before having it. Anyway, I wouldn't be surprised if it got out one day that part of the reason Timothy cried rape was because she felt guilty about cheating on her boyfriend. Number 9. The reason Timothy resorted to a Twitter accusation is because she can't press charges. Actually, the alleged assault took place in California where the statute of limitations on penetration of the genitals with a foreign object before January 1st, 2017 is six years. Timothy is, and always has been, welcome to sue. Nobody is stopping her. Like I said earlier, she stated that the reason she isn't suing is because she doesn't want Melanie to go to jail, but she wants to end her career over it. But rape isn't a serious crime, crime like stabbing. But you can't support both her and her rapist. But she and Eve don't care what happens to Melanie. But Atlantic Records are terrible for employing her. But it's no big deal. A series of jokes, if I ever heard one. Number 10. 
Then why isn't Melanie suing for slander? Not sure. My guess is that Melanie knows she'd be suing Timothy for money she doesn't have, so there wouldn't be any return to cover the court costs, leaving less money to produce her musical. And her fans have already done a decent job of clearing her name. Also, court is a big time suck, and I cannot stress enough that it could have delayed her projects by multiple years. Other people's guesses? Well, there are rumors that she's broke after making the Mad Hatter music video and then not releasing anything for years. And then, of course, it was revealed that she's been working on a musical that's coming out on September 6th, which I'm sure was a huge cash drain. Maybe she doesn't want to deal with it. Maybe she wants to be merciful on her former friend. Or maybe, being the real victim in this situation, Melanie is not emotionally prepared, or maybe she's paranoid. All I can say for sure is, every time Timothy cries rape, she's extending the period of time that Melanie can sue her for slander. And the more Melanie loses because of Timothy, the more Timothy will lose when she's found guilty. So by all means, Timmy, keep shooting your mouth off. Once this album and musical drop and she wins a Grammy, she'll have all the resources in the world to sue you with, and the money won't matter at that point. And more on this point, this is a really hypocritical accusation to make. Why isn't Melanie suing for slander? Well, why isn't Timothy trying to press charges? See what I'm getting at here? Them not taking this to court proves nothing for either side. Number 11. Timothy is telling the truth. That's why most people sided with Timothy. Now that's easy to prove false with numbers you can look up yourself at any time. Timothy had an initial spike in followers after the accusation, but her follower count steadily declined with the passage of time. As of proofreading my script, on July 10th, 2019, at 5.36 a.m., please help me. She has 62,800 followers, whereas Melanie has 5.8 million. Nobody who's anybody believes Timothy, but Melanie has plenty of people in her corner. Anyone saying otherwise is lying. For example, Katy Perry adores Melanie, calling her one of her favorite artists. And Timothy is telling the truth because why? One of the Chanel's from Scream Queen said so? Also, this whole argument is a logical fallacy called bandwagon. Maybe instead of being a sheep and following the crowd, you should make your own choices based on logic. Number 12. I always knew there was something off about her. Just look at her during her shows. Oh, okay, let me help you out. It's called Merma Nijinawena. She's high all the damn time. She's shy, so she smokes weed to calm herself down before shows. This isn't a guess or even something I've inferred. It's a well-known fact. The origin is a Playbuzz article, but I found it on the wiki. Here's a few pictures of her toking to illustrate my point. The woman likes to smoke weed. It's not a crime. Well, it is in some places, but that's beside the point. I personally disagree with smoking pot. It's far safer to vape it or bake it into brownies, but it's still not a crime on par with rape. It shouldn't be a crime to begin with, and in California, it isn't one at all. And if you're going to judge Mel for being a pothead, you gotta judge Tim the same way. Because don't be fooled, she very much enjoys it. Number 13. Actually, what's off about her is how creepy she is. Right, yes, yes. But we don't arrest people for being creepy. Yeah, Bruce, know that guy we got in the tank? Uh, the creepy one? Yeah, better let him go. Number 14. So what? She still sexualizes babies and glamorizes mental illness. This is a comment I've seen over and over again. I have addressed the first in a video and have considered making a sequel. The second video is about the mental illness thing. That's been upcoming for a while, but I was too depressed for, to work on it. The short version is the song isn't about being crazy. It's about being treated like you're crazy. It's Alice in Wonderland themed for fuck's sake. And the baby thing is a metaphor that evolved out of the fact that toy sounds inspired her or some shit like that. Nevertheless, both of these arguments were addressed by Melanie before the alleged assaults, and neither of these arguments are relevant to rape discourse. Section 7. Why Timothy Heller fans remain loyal in spite of basic logic. A lesson on cognitive dissonance and being manipulated. This is sort of a subsection of other questionable behavior, 
but it's very long and I think it fit the end better. Some people may observe that it's strange that Timothy still has people who believe her when she's so obviously lying. There are the easy answers, that they're just not smart, and some people just overdo it and believe everyone who claims to be a victim because other people refuse to believe anyone. And of course, since a lot of crybabies were young and Timothy's fans are former crybabies, it makes sense that her fan base would be largely made up of young, naive people. But I also suspect the way Timothy encourages her fans to attack Melanie fans plays a role. Yes, despite claiming in a flip-floppy way that this isn't about punishing Melanie, Timothy is actually very militant in trying to destroy her reputation and she takes it personally if you don't believe her. Ever heard of cognitive dissonance? It's a psychological phenomenon that occurs when people have a set of beliefs that conflicts with their actions. It was started by Leon Festinger, hopefully I pronounced that right, sometime in the 1950s, don't make me look this shit up. Encyclopedia Britannica says, Cognitive dissonance, the mental conflict that occurs when beliefs or assumptions are contradicted by new information. The unease or tension that the conflict arouses in people is relieved by one of several defensive maneuvers. They reject, explain away, or avoid the new information, persuade themselves that no conflict really exists, reconcile their differences, or resort to any other defensive means of preserving stability or order in their conceptions of the world and of themselves. So how is this relevant, you may be asking? Well, Timothy Heller encourages her fans to bully Melly Martinez fans by giving positive reinforcement to those who do and admonishes those who choose to remain neutral. And so, Many Timothy fans choose to bully, both for personal reasons and in hopes of getting attention. Timothy has been caught liking tweets from bullies and saying she's going to be positive in the same fucking thread. And the bullies believe that they're in the right because they're defending a rape victim and I clearly need water, so hold on one second. Now, of course, it's pretty clear that Timothy is lying, but in order for them to admit that, the corollary is that they have to admit that they cyberbullied people who were in the right. They'd have to admit that Melanie is innocent, that they attacked an innocent person, and slash or people who defended an innocent person, and that would, of course, make them a piece of shit. Well, I got good news for you, ashamed Timothy converts. Basically, everyone is a piece of shit, including me. Join the club. Uh, well, I mean, technically, you owe Melanie and her fans an apology. Some people definitely owe me one, but none of it matters. Why? Because at this rate, we're destroying our own planet and facing a human extinction. Good luck apologizing to every single person you called a rape apologist in the YouTube comments when we're all finally dead. Yay. Thing is, what you did may have been wrong, and that's on you. So it's understandable if you feel guilty. But beware of cognitive dissonance. Continuing to support Timothy after all she's done will only make you feel worse in the end. It's not too late to escape the trap and do what's right. You'll save more face that way. And after all, she was using you all along. Manipulating you. Making a fool out of you. If anything, you should be pissed off. And of course, cognitive dissonance can also be used to explain other behavior, like the girl who paid Timothy $15 for a shout out, never got it, and continued to support her. Otherwise, she'd have to be supporting a lying thief. Or the people who destroyed or otherwise got rid of their Melanie Martinez merge, connections, whatever. To do all that only to realize Timothy was lying all along would hurt quite a bit. And many people don't want to face that. So they protect their feelings by living in denial of their own mistakes. I have the same answer for those people. Continuing to support Timothy after all she's done will only make you feel worse in the end. It's not too late to escape the trap and do what's right. You'll save more face that way. Closing thoughts. <gasps> I never thought I'd be done with this. I've been working on it for months. <clears throat> Some people will always believe Timothy, and the whole situation reeks of racist overtones. White girl smokes pot, and there's nothing wrong with that. Latina smokes pot, she's a pothead. White girl is bisexual, that's her identity. Latina is bisexual, she's a deviant. 
White girl cries rape, everyone believes her. White girl deserves people to stream her music out of pity. Latina is only popular because she was on The Voice. Latina was proven innocent, but she's still a rapist because a white girl said so. And I know this isn't everyone's thoughts, but if they're yours, fuck off my channel because racists aren't welcome here. Now time for a reminder of something I mentioned earlier on in this video and in the Tim vid called Occam's Razor. The simplest explanation is more likely to be true. I've gotten enough people making sad attempts to debate me to notice that believing Timothy requires you to make loads of excuses for her behavior. You have to explain all her esoteric behaviors away with assertions like, well, she was traumatized, or but she's mentally ill. Meanwhile, believing Timothy requires no mental gymnastics whatsoever. Thus, I conclude that believing Melanie is innocent is the simplest solution and the most likely to be true. Also, while many of the above points I made would mean little on their own, when you string them all together like this and account for the fact that actual proof she's lying about certain details accompanies it, it makes a lot more sense if you don't believe Timothy than if you do. Thus, Melanie is the person you should all be siding with since I've spent the past hour or so explaining why Timothy is a proven liar on multiple counts. I would like to conclude this video with a call to action. Don't worry, it's easy. <clears throat> Stop giving Timothy Heller attention. And blessed be, motherfuckers.